four score and hypertrophy concepts and tools 27 years ago. Yes, yes. I decided, since it's quarantine times, to grow out my facial hair. Then I decided that I hate the way my mustache feels. And I did the Abraham Lincoln Amish guy thing. And I decided Wolverine looks a little cooler. So so maybe, uh, do I look like Wolverine? Uh, uh, does he do that? Anyway, you guys let me know how ridiculous I sound. But on things that are a little less ridiculous, hypertrophy concepts tools number 27. Super, super, super important one that I'm sure will get lots of views. Measuring your progress. Because we know we're in the gym to progress in our muscle size, some of us, there have to be ways to measure if and how much progress, or worse, none, we're actually getting. And the good news is that we can do it through a couple of different ways that are complementary, that have taken together, paint a really good picture, and then we don't have to be in the dark about how fast we're making gains, if we're making gains, and so on and so forth. Now, real quick, why are we interested in measuring progress? Well, it's critical to a couple of things. First of all, program design. How do you know which programs you've built work better and which ones work worse? If you don't ever measure progress, you won't know. You'll just be like, ah, I think this program looks fine. It could be a total guess. Second is auto-regulation. Auto-regulation often involves adjusting volumes and loads and various other parameters based on your responses. And if you don't really know your responses, then how are you supposed to auto-regulate? Are you getting stronger is a good question. Well, how do you know if you're not measuring it, right? Next one is program change. People say, oh man, I've hit a plateau. I need to change my program. Very reasonable. But how, if you're not measuring progress appropriately, do you even know you've hit a plateau? I've personally interacted with people, for example, that have said, oh man, I'm not gaining any weight. And I, you know, I'm, I'm eating all these calories. And I've sort of gotten back to them and said, well, you know, try this, try this, try that. And then I got wise because all that stuff didn't pan out. And now I ask people another thing when they say, look, I can't gain weight. I ask them a really crazy question. Well, how much weight have you gained in the past several months? And a lot of times it'd be like, well, like five pounds. I'm like, man, that's really good. That's a really good pace. So what they meant when they said they weren't gaining weight was they weren't gaining as much weight as they had liked, which is actually too much weight too fast. So you have to be able to quantify progress in order to actually have a real world approach to see, okay, is my program working or does it need to change? Another thing about program change is a lot of people will switch a program basically just for anxiety reasons, you know, like the analysis paralysis sort of situation. They got crap, like I could be getting better gains and they switch the program. If they look back at their old program and apply some of the principles uh, or practices we're going to be using here, uh, they would actually realize that their old program was getting great gains. And uh, if we know that, then why the hell would we even switch, right? And then lastly, hugely in coaching others. So with yourself, you might have sort of an intuitive feel just based on how strong you are, sort of how jack you look, which we'll get to as some of our actual formal methods of uh, ascertaining gains. But if you're coaching someone else, you may only communicate through pictures and videos on occasion. You're not there in real life watching them. And uh, it becomes really, really, really important to be able to somehow quantify their progress for two reasons. The big reason is to make sure they're getting it and to alter variables to make sure they're getting it. And two uh, is to some extent, to show the person that they're actually making progress. Because sometimes people don't know that they're making progress and muscle adds slowly, so it's hard to tell if you're getting more jacked. People can get dis discouraged. And if you can show them some things, which we'll show you in a bit, like repetition strength, for example, show them that they have been getting stronger for reps, that really tends to relight the fire and keep folks going on the right track. So good news is this a rather simple lecture. There are only four best, best, best ways in which to measure muscle growth progress over the short, medium, and long term. And just by using these four, you won't really need to do anything else. For the pretty convincing case, for the fact that all the other stuff that you could try to ascertain is so erroneous as to not be worth your time. So let's get right into it. The first indicator of progress in terms of muscle growth, by the way, is all muscle growth here, is actually what we would call a leading indicator. It occurs before the progress actually does. In this case, it's raw stimulus magnitude and stimulus to fatigue ratio. These things, when they are high, predict progress because they correlate to what is causing progress, robust hypertrophy stimulus, okay? That's like looking at indices of how full you are and looking at a picture of a meal in reference to a normal size something, a cell phone, right? And you look at this picture of a meal that you're about to eat. 
Could you say that that picture tells you nothing about how full you're gonna be? Well, of course it tells you something. If it's a whole plate of food that looks like five times the size of your giant cell phone, you're probably gonna get full. But if it's this tiny little piece of food, you're probably not. Even though you've yet to eat anything, these are pictures are leading indicators for how full you're gonna be in just the same way. If you're doing a good job in the gym, that doesn't mean right then and there in the gym you grow muscle, but it sure as hell sets you up. What are these things? Well, we've been through them a ton in Hypertrophy Concepts of Tools, so just a quick review, but you guys already know these. If your session of training, your previous sessions for the previous day, weeks, months, anything, have had the target muscle experiencing lots of tension, that is a good thing. Burn in the higher reps, that is a good thing. Pumps from training, that's a very good thing. And a feeling and sensation and perception and measurement by strength of disruption is a very, very good thing. If these things are happening and you're getting a lot of them, then you're probably on your way to gains. As long as two other things are occurring. One, your fatigue is in check, which is why it's not just raw stimulus magnitude, but stimulus to fatigue ratio. If your joints feel good during this time, and if your systemic fatigue isn't super crazy high and you're getting back to back to back, awesome, awesome, high raw stimulus magnitude sessions, you're halfway there. Okay, all right, two thirds of the way there. You got the high raw stimulus, a good st stimulus to fatigue ratio, that's one and two. And three is your nutrition and recovery strategies are fundamentally in line. Because it doesn't matter how good your workouts are, if you don't eat food and enough protein, you won't grow muscle nearly as much as you could or at all. And if you're not getting rest and sleep and relaxation, you also won't grow muscle or nearly as much as you can. But if your food is fundamentally good, if your rest is fundamentally good, you're getting good workouts. You're probably on your way to some decent gains, at least the best kinds of gains you could be getting. Now, here's the thing. This is nowhere near the sole predictor of gains. It's not actually even a measurement of gains, it's just a predictor. Predictions are all flawed and this isn't a perfect one. But a couple of good things are going for it. It is a leading indicator, which means you don't actually have to wait to change and correct course, whether it be through your program or diet or anything like that. For example, if your program is sound and you're not getting pumps in the gym, and you're eating very few carbs, you increase your carbs right then and there. And then your workouts get awesome and you start getting huge pumps. That probably means you started to create more muscle gain without having to spend months looking back, measuring it and being like, crap, I guess I was for months under eating carbs, right? You can course correct right away because these indices are apparent within every single workout, right? Awesome, awesome to have this. This is a unique tool in our arsenal that does not require you to wait. It's a right away predictor of which way you're going, so it can definitely shoot you to, to the right place. Secondly, if you're checking these boxes of high raw stimulus magnitude and a good stimulus to fatigue ratio with good food and recovery and all that, it is not a guarantee that you're gonna be growing well because you could just be reaching your genetic ceiling and even though everything's going great, the amount of fractional protein turnover is just not very high, right? However, if you are not checking these boxes or much at all, if you really don't feel tension in the target muscle, not a burn on the target muscle with higher reps, very, very disappointing pumps or no pumps at all, and no evidence of muscle disruption, then you have a serious cause for concern. So this can almost be like a contrapositive finding where if you don't have a raw stimulus magnitude and a high degree of stimulus to fatigue ratio, then you should be doing something about it to get one because measuring months later and be like, oh, I guess I didn't grow any muscle. I should have known because my workouts were crappy, right? So this is a super, super important tool. So when people you know, do their training and they sort of ask you as a coach or trainer, like, hey, am I growing muscle? You could just be like, hey, how's your tension, burn, pumps, disruption? And they'd be like, dude, everything's wild, right? Maybe the only thing you have to worry about is that they're doing too much, right? And how do we know we're not doing too much is our next indicator, and that is repetition strength. So rep strength, means two things, potentially, or a combination of both. One, you're doing more reps at the same weight than you were any other time before. We'll talk more specifically about how to best compare. Or two, you are using the same repetitions but doing more weight, or both if you're a real baller, right? So basically, like you used to bench 225 for 10, now you're benching 235 for 10 or 240 for 10. Or you used to bench 225 for 10, and now you're benching 225 for 12 or 13. Or you used to bench 225 for 10, and now you're benching 235 for 12. Something is going up 
And that's probably a good thing. How do we know rep strength is correlated to muscle gains? Because if your training is really similar, after a while, neural factors really don't play a huge role. The only way to get stronger is adding size. Also, neural factors probably affect how many reps you can do, but they probably affect your one rep max a little bit more. So when you're adding reps or adding weight and reps, it's probably a lot to do with just sheer muscle size. Another factor is that the biggest people in the world are often the strongest for reps. Maybe not for singles, but definitely for reps. You show me someone that's benching 405 for 20 reps, squatting 600 for 10 reps, and deadlifting 700 for 10 reps, and rowing 315 with strict technique for sets of 15, they are going to be fucking enormous, and there's no way around it. There's no technique around it. If you're doing heavy reps, you're going to be jacked. So the more heavy reps you can do, or the more weight you can do with the same number of reps, the better and the very likely that your muscle gain is occurring. But there are ways that the nervous system and some structural remodeling of muscle, sort of which way it points, can sort of poison the analysis. So we've got to take some, some due diligence to make sure we're doing this right, comparing the right things the right ways to try to factor out the nervous system and architectural changes and really get to our strength correlations actually predict muscle growth best. So a couple ways to do this. One is we want to reserve comparisons for the same ranges, not between them. So for example, you said, you know, I squatted 405 for five back in the day. And then recently I did 315 for 12. Like which one of those is more impressive? It's really impossible to compare because there's a specificity to doing reps. You could just get good at one and worse at the other. You really want to compare in the same rep range. What did I do for sets of five to 10 in some exercise versus what I did at sets of five to 10 later? That comparison is going to be much tighter than separating out the ranges because there just can be some specificity there. And also, even if there isn't, even if there's absolute gains indicated, it's really hard to tell how many reps, you know, how much weight at 25 reps is more impressive than how much weight at sets of seven reps, right? It, it really, really difficult to ascertain that. Secondly, fatigue can mask improvements within a mesocycle, right? People think, okay, I'm gaining strength week to week to week. That means maybe that you're just not adding enough volume, right? And if you're adding enough volume, you won't be gaining a ton of strength, but you'll actually be stimulating a ton of hypertrophy increase. So it's very difficult to see in a mesocycle what's going on. So you measure meso to meso, which means... Let's say you squatted from 400 to 415, you got 415 for a set of eight. The next mesocycle, maybe you go from 405 to 420. And then in that third microcycle, you hit up 415 and maybe you do it for nine or 10. That's a good comparison because we're comparing not only mesocycle to mesocycle, but we're comparing the end of a mesocycle in both cases, or even better, 420 you did, let's say, for nine reps, and then that was in the peak week, the last week before deload, and in the mesocycle before, you did 415 for eight. I mean, 420 for nine is better than 415 for eight. That's a very good sign that good things are happening, right? So we not only measure meso to meso, but usually the same point in every mesocycle. And because you try your hardest, close to fail, in the peak week of every meso, that's a really, really good time to compare. So basically, at the end of every mesocycle's accumulation phase, you write down all your reps. You should be writing them down anyway. Write down all your weights. Max meso, you write them down, and you compare. And it should be progress, right? And how much progress? You know, sometimes a lot, sometimes a little bit. The same exercises have to be used, okay? If someone told me, like, hey, look, I leg press four or five for 10 a couple months ago, and this 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 time I squatted, uh, hack squatted 405 for eight, did I get stronger? What the hell am I supposed to know? Different people convert, different machines convert differently from exercise to exercise. So much uh, neural, neural and technical learning involved. Who the hell knows? So it's gotta be the same exercises too, and they should be contiguous. That means you should be training them for a while. So for example, if you've been training squats continuously for two mesocycles, now you're getting some good data as to how, how strong you really are because of your muscle growth, not because of neural adaptations. So mesos like two and three and four, you can really compare and see maybe how much muscle you've gained. Whereas meso one of squatting, if you haven't done it in a while, that's going to be a lot of neural gains. It's going to look artificially much weaker than your muscle size actually indicates. Another way to compare is to compare exercises that you haven't done in a long time. So let's say six months ago is the last time you done uh, barbell bent over rows with the uh, 45s touching the ground. Now that you're doing them again, 
If one mesocycle later, you're hitting all time PRs again, that's a real good sign that you have a bigger back because there's some neural relearning that has to occur, but about a mesocycle later, most of that's happened. And if you're getting huge PRs, holy crap, that's a really good sign. A bad sign would be if you hit mass massive PRs in the bent row six months ago, and it takes you four months again to even start scratching the surface to almost hit your new PRs. Can you really say you grew back muscle in the interim? I mean, probably not. Which what the hell is that muscle doing not helping you bent row more weight? right? Has to be. I mean, this goes without saying at this point, just got to say it to make sure it's out there. Must be good technique because if you start cheating your technique, you don't really know what you're comparing anymore because it could just be partial reps versus full reps. And yes, you should want to push for PRs only with good technique. So it's not so much that you're pushing for PRs, especially in the last week, you're just doing your best with good technique and you let the PRs happen. I'll put it to you this way. If you do leg presses, your best was four or five for a set of 10. Months later, you're leg pressing four or five. If by 10, you reach essentially technical failure, but you grind two more dog shit reps out by cutting your depth, or worse, you know that you're not gonna hit 10 by about rep eight with strict technique, and reps nine, 10, 11, 12 are awful, you're essentially cheating, gee, you you can write down and say, hey, a two rep PR. Who the fuck are you lying to? Your entire analysis is supposed to tell you if you're growing muscle or not. And because you would have hit 10 reps one way or another, basically it's telling you, you probably haven't. Do you really want to conclude that you have when you really haven't? Do you really want to think your program is good when it's really not? Do you really want to think you did a good job losing fat and not muscle when you clearly maybe lost some muscle or certainly didn't gain any? No. Always strict technique and don't really worry about the numbers so much as much as just do your best. And when you look back at your old numbers, you'd be like, oh my God, I got 205 for five. I just did it for eight. That's the way you know you gain muscle, a process of discovering that you became stronger just by using your body, not inching your way and a little cheating here and there, a little body English, a longer rest before a next set just to hit a PR. That is literally cheating yourself of the knowledge of did you grow muscle and how much, right? Here's the deal, using the sort of contrapositive approach, if after three to six months of a muscle gain phase, for example, if you're not getting stronger on a bunch of lifts for reps, something is amiss, something is wrong. Sometimes people will say with all the best intentions, and this is sort of misapplied in many cases, they'd be like, don't worry about how strong you're getting, it's all about quality contractions, good technique, and all this other stuff. They have a point not to overvalue strength and pursue it at the detriment of all these other things. But if all those other things are occurring and you're gaining muscle, you should be getting stronger. And if your honest analysis is that you're not getting stronger, something is not good and you need to reanalyze the plan, reanalyze your application, so on and so forth. Next, this is a funny one because it's so straightforward, body weight and appearance. This is not rocket science. Here's what you do. You note how you look in the mirror you guys look in the mirror a ton anyway. You should be experts at this. Certain veins, do you have them? Like it's some body fat, this one shoulder vein just comes in. Okay, and you think you're super lean, but it's not there. And you know that it's supposed to be there because last time you took pictures a year ago, it was. Shit, I'm not as lean as I think I am. And I'm at a certain weight. That means I didn't gain as much muscle as I thought I did. Okay, so there you go. Certain veins. Number of abs, right? If you normally at 220 pounds have a four pack, and then you've lost a bunch of fat and then you've done a great muscle gain phase and now you're 220 pounds and you have a six pack, gee, that's really good. That probably means you gain muscle. There's really not any way around that. Clarity of lines, how deeply etched are your abs? How much can you see your bicep separating from your tricep from the side? Things like that. You're real expert at looking at your body because you do it all the time. I sure as hell look at my body all the time, right? If you get to know how your body looks and you're honest with yourself, progress pictures can help as well you sort of know where you stand. And you know, based on body weight, where you stand relatively to how much muscle you have probably and how much fat, for example. If months later, you're much leaner than you were looking, but you're not much lighter, that's a really good sign. That probably means you lost a lot of fat, but not a lot of muscle, and you might have gained some muscle. If months later, after your first sort of visual assessment, and these are always continuous, of course. If months later you're heavier, but just not much fatter, that's a really good sign. A lot of pro bodybuilders will post pictures in the off season and they'll say, you know, this is the leanest I've ever been at this weight. They don't mean that they're proud of their leanest because, or their leanness, because like, 
they look like shit compared to when they were on stage. This is a fat dude, right? Way off season shape. But because it's the leanest they have ever been at 300 pounds or whatever, they know that they're carrying more muscle than usual. And once they cut it down, they'll probably, instead of weighing 240 on stage, weigh 248 on stage. And that's way more muscle. Great, great tool for keeping track of that. If you return back to an old weight you've been down to before, but you're way leaner than before, that's great. For example, in my own case, actually right now, when uh, I did my last year's fat loss cycle, I got to a certain standard level of leanness that I remember well based on exactly sort of how my lines look and all the details and etching of what bullshit details I do have. And I was 215 pounds at the time. Right now, as I record this video, I'm around 230 pounds. And on some days, I'm getting awfully close to looking like what I did at 215. Now, does that mean I gained 15 pounds of muscle? Hell no. There's some other extenuating circumstances and body water is involved. But once my body water looks similar and once my leanness looks exactly like it did, I'll probably weigh something like 220 to 225. Man, that's way better than 215. Something has to give. That's not just magic or random. That's probably some muscle gain, at least some pounds of that. Again here, the contrapositive, the opposite. I sure hope I'm using that word correctly. The opposite is real bad news, right? If you had some pictures of yourself when you weighed 215 last time and you're looking like something and you're now 212 past 215 and you still don't look that sharp, oh boy, not good. Do not pat yourself in the back for having gained muscle, right? Here are ways to make sure you're doing this properly, the mirror and the scale combo. First of all, you only compare the same phase with the same phase. Fat loss to fat loss and the same timing within these phases. Four weeks into fat loss, four weeks into fat loss. Eight weeks into fat loss, eight weeks into fat loss. Muscle gain, week one, muscle gain week one from six months ago. Why? If you're in a fat loss phase, after eight weeks, you've burned a certain amount of glycogen. That means you're going to be relatively flat. That means your scale weight's going to be low for how not great you look. If you took one week after that and transitioned to a mass gain phase, you're going to look a, like a god because you're going to be one week into massing. You're still essentially almost exactly as lean as you were, if not exactly as lean. And your glycogen is full to the brim. So all of a sudden, instead of weighing 195, looking flat and sort of stringy, you're weighing 202 pounds and you look even better. And you think if you compare first week of mass this time to the last week of your cut last time, you're going to be like, oh my god, dude, like... I gained like 18 pounds of muscle. Bullshit. But if you compare the first week of massing and the first week of massing, the glycogen is similar, the dryness is similar, the roundness is similar, and the scale weight is very comparable. Not to say it's the same, but at that point, any differences may be differences in muscle and fat, and you can get that much better of a perception. Also, from those of you folks that are involved in hypertrophy training at a pretty advanced level know, after several weeks of cutting, your glycogen may be so low, you're down just five pounds in glycogen alone. And if you think you lost five pounds of muscle, because that's what it looks like visually, you're super wrong. Because after one week of eating lots of carbs, you're like, oh my God, I gained five pounds of muscle. It doesn't work like that. Here's the deal. Again, the sort of the contrapositive here. If you have to really ponder if you look like you've made gains or not, or if the scale has moved relative to your body fat, you probably have not made significant gains. Right? If you have to squint and sort of like, well, in this lighting, I kind of, and you know you're aligned to yourself, at least with experience. I'll have times when I'm at the gym, or nowadays during, recorded during quarantine at home, well, I'll like, uh, like flex in the mirror into the camera or the cell phone, and I'll look at it, and within like two seconds, or if it's just the mirror, I just do this, I'm like, man, today's not the day, <laughs> right? Uh, nothing, nothing to look at. Because for example, I'll be at the end of a cutting cycle and I'm just trying to see, do I see any new detail I've never seen before? It's usually pretty open and shut. If you weigh 220 pounds at the beginning of a mass phase and the last time you started your mass at 210 and you get a huge chest pump and you flex in the mirror at the gym and there's just bullshit just all over that you've never seen before, don't you worry, you're making gains. But if you flex and you're like, ah, uh, and someone's like, is this the best you've ever looked? And you're like, ah, uh, not good or at least something to think about and not get too excited about having gained a bunch, right? Lastly, and least, least important, least powerful, 
is body composition measurement. I know that's crazy, right? This is RP supposed to be about science and everything, and we took actual scientific body composition measurement and put it last. Why? Fundamentally, it is because these things have too much error to conclude about intra-individual change, change between you earlier and you now. They just have too much error, even the best ones. A couple of things you can use, however, and here's how to use them. You can do personal one or two site skin folds on yourself. So you essentially skin fold yourself in the exact same spot, maybe right next to your belly button. You pinch properly. You put the skin fold calipers on your skin, and then you measure how many millimeters it has. And that measurement is only a reliability estimate. That measurement does not tell you how fat you are. It just says 11 millimeters. And as you are massing, maybe a last mass cycle, you also did that, your last muscle gain phase you measured, and you noticed that you got like uh, towards the end of being able to see your abs slash sloppy fat, when you cut off your mass phase, you were uh, 170 pounds and it was a 16 measurement on your caliper, right? 16 millimeters, which doesn't have to mean anything. What percent body fat is that? Who the fuck knows? I don't know. One site sure as hell doesn't tell you that. But you have that measurement and you've taken measurements twice a week, okay, for a long time, and you ended your last mass, you were a little bit sloppy at 16, right? This mass phase or this muscle gain phase, you've come up, come up, come up, and you weigh 170 again, just like you did last time. Except now you're calipering 12. What does that mean? That means because you have less fat on your stomach, almost certainly you have less fat everywhere else. And because you have four more millimeters of fat to fill in, but you're already at your old body weight, that for sure means you're more muscular now. And good news, you have more muscle to gain. So now you have two really great options. You can stop muscle gain phase now, super fucking lean, and then get even leaner and then potentially eat more muscle mass later, and even leaner very easily because you're not even up to 16 like you were last time. Or you can keep going to anywhere between 12, 13, 14, 15, or 16 millimeters, which could take you another three months. And then by the time you're at 16 again, which means probably you're roughly at the same body fat percentage as you were, now you might weigh like 177. Oh my God, that's awesome. You gained like five pounds of muscle from that point on. But again, the contrapositive here is if you weigh 168 and you're clipping a 16 and you used to weigh 170 at the same time of the same cycle back then and you were clipping a 16, not a good sign, not a good sign, right? So these things can be done, but remember, it's just reliability. It's not accuracy. So you have no idea what body fat you are but you know what these skin folds are. Now, an interesting way to do this is getting a DEXA, which we'll talk about next, at the end of a fat loss phase, for example, and or at the top end of a muscle gain phase. And that same day that you get a DEXA, you do the skin fold of your own abdominal region. Once you do that skin fold, you realize that, okay, this DEXA says I'm roughly 7% fat and the skin fold is like a five. And then it says I'm roughly, you know, on a mass gain phase, it says I'm 14% fat and the skin fold is a 20 you can interpolate those numbers, right? You know, when you go, so 7% to 14 and you scale that in with, you know, skin fold is five, skin fold is 20, you get basically a conversion chart. It's really easy to do for like roughly what skin fold is roughly, very roughly what body fat percent. Cause you ain't gonna get a DEXA every week. <laughs> you actually can get a DEXA once a week and be just at the federally mandated maximum exposure of radiation limits. <laughs> I don't know if you want to throw away $100 a week to basically go to the dentist once a week uh, radiation-wise. So this gives you the ability to sort of replicate a DEXA kind of all the time. Really, really cool, neat trick if you want to try it. And it only takes essentially two DEXAs. And then it works for years later. Now, at some point, your body's going to change, muscles grow, fat stretches, so on and so forth, skin stretches. You might want to redo this process every couple of years, but this is a really, really good start. So... Great, great tool. What about the DEXA? Okay, the DEXA is really, really good, but anything shy of about six to 12 months of time for comparison is too frequent and error can just eat up all of the changes. Okay, so you're looking at changes and all you see is actually error, even though you don't know that. Like you were 13% body fat last time, this time it says 11. Turns out you could have actually been 10% last time and this time you could have actually been 12. You have no idea right? Because the range of error is like one to 3%, right? Great for measuring big populations and seeing if creatine works in one group versus another because the average cancel themselves out. But for individual to individual to individual, you and you and you, it's very, very difficult to tell what kind of muscle gains or fat losses have actually occurred. 
It's bad to get a DEXA and be unsure of what's going on. It's worse to get a DEXA and be convinced that it's an incredibly precise and accurate instrument and to make program changes on it that are unwarranted, for example. Let's say you had a new way of dieting that you tried. You'd be a little bit, a little bit more fasting, a little bit more high intensity cardio, and you were super busy with stuff so you didn't sleep as much. And you get a DEXA before that fat loss phase and after, three months. So the potential for how much change there is isn't a lot. The potential error measurement is very, very high. You did that, and also you made another cardinal mistake. You did a DEXA last time at the end of a muscle gain phase, and this time you did it at the beginning of a fat loss phase, or the other way around. What you end up doing is detecting potentially one of three things. Thing one is sweet, is just accuracy and precision, so you actually got a really good result. And you can use it to say, wow, this is exactly what happened, and this phase worked relatively well. Everything I did here seemed to... I didn't lose any muscle, I didn't gain any, but I lost a lot of fat. Great, okay. Thing two is it can make it seem that you lost a crap load of muscle and gained a ton of fat or just didn't lose any fat. Like I've seen DEXAs of people that clearly got leaner and it said they just lost all muscle. Just measurement error. That is really, can be devastating because it super pisses you off. Like, oh my God, like I tried my best and yeah, it wasn't like amazing. I didn't do everything right, but for the love of God, did you just really lose seven pounds of muscle? Almost certainly not. But there's the worst thing, which is when you do something like I just described, your training is, uh, your diet is a little bit not enough food spread throughout the day, your cardio is a little bit too intense, and you weren't getting enough sleep, and the DEXA come back, and due to error, it says you lost eight pounds of fat and gained two pounds of muscle. What are you going to think if you don't know any better? And I've been that person to not know any better for years. You're going to be like, oh my God, I have discovered the holy grail of fat loss while gaining muscle. And if someone tells you, hey man, sleep's really important, you probably shouldn't miss it, you're like, whatever, I lost a ton of fat and gained muscle at the same time, not even sleeping enough. And this new cardio, it's so fun, it's hard, high intensity, it's hardcore, I don't have to eat all the time either, I can just eat two meals a day and I'm golden. Where in reality, what you did was you actually lost muscle and lost a little bit of fat, but lost a lot of muscle. But the DEXA didn't pick that up because its measurement error is small, but significant on those essentially on those windows of comparisons that we want individual to individual to individual. So that idea that you did great, but you really didn't, good God, because then you're going to apply that same phase. At least if the DEXA lies to you and says you suck, you have some impetus to improve a maybe already good plan. But if you think your shitty plan is great because the DEXA told you so, you could have another year of dog shit results, and then here's what happens. You get another DEX, and this time it flips the switch on you and shows you the reality. And you're like, oh my God, I lost six pounds of muscle last year, and I didn't lose any fat? What the what the hell? But but my old, what about my old DEXA? And then all of a sudden you're thinking, oh, well, this DEX is wrong. The one I got before is right. Don't get yourself down that road. These things have huge, huge limitations. Using them to establish the skinfold thing is a good thing to do. Maybe getting them once every two years or so is a good thing just for baseline values. Otherwise, you're putting way too much stock into a device that was not designed to do what you want it to do, which is track individual changes in body composition over weeks or even over months. It's designed to compare various individuals' body composition, by the way. It's really actually designed to compare bone densities. So along with this, you may be thinking, okay, if DEXA, which is awesome, has such a poor applicability to our hypertrophy journey of judging if we're progressing or not, how does bioelectrical impedance analysis, the thing where you hold the handles, how does that weigh in? What about bod pod? What about skin folds? All that stuff really just has even bigger errors, does not tell you. And by skin folds, I don't mean just the one site reliability comparison. I mean like a three site or seven site formula one, which tells you a body fat percent. You go, ha, this is what it is. Right? Those can be done actually if you have someone experienced doing them for you. Again, for reliability, they can be done week to week to week and show you tracking and progress. Those are great. But unfortunately, if you use them just once every three or four months and say, ha, I gained five pounds of muscle, not a good idea. Not a good idea at all. Right? Those things, bioelectrical and penis analysis, bod pod, skin folds, et cetera, they don't tell you anything that the scale, mirror, and rep strength don't already tell you. So my biggest advice and to close out this discussion is, Make sure you're keeping super on tabs with raw stimulus magnitude, stimulus to fatigue ratio. Have great workouts, number one. Number two, 
get your nutrition and sleep and everything relaxation wise in line to guarantee or enhance the probability that those great workouts are going to be causing muscle growth. Next, make sure you're keeping track of your repetition strength and make sure you're looking at the scale in the mirror and paying close attention. You can also do the skinfold caliper thing just on yourself, on your close to belly button region properly, week in, week out and have good data. You can do an even better job by referencing that to an every couple of years DEXA. But after that, any more investigation, skin folds and bod pod and tons of DEXAs do you no good and they're gonna steer you wrong. Folks, thank you so much for tuning in. We'll see you for the next lecture.